welcome back to my channel. I hope you all are having a wonderful spring. I know that it's getting warmer and the flowers are blooming and I've been working in my garden a lot. As you can see, I have a bruise on my arm because I've been pruning branches and trees and all of those wonderful things that come with the springtime. But I know that there's a lot of work in the springtime, but once you get it all done now, it's going to be so much better because you're going to be able to relax and have a lemonade and sit under your beautiful trees and enjoy your garden during the summertime so this week we are going to be in exodus chapter 20 when we're going to actually learn about the 10 commandments i have my bible here and my king james bible and i also have my ipad where i have my notes in there so let's get to it today but first let's talk about last week and last week we learned on how God was proving his partnership and fellowships with the Israelites who he brought out of Egypt, out of slavery. And eventually, one of the very first commandments that we're going to learn about today is going to be how much God doesn't want for them to follow other gods like they were used to back in Egypt. One of the first uh, commandments is going to be that we should love God, and, and, and that's one of the primary things here. So basically, a lot of the things that they were going through, they needed to go through because they were a very complacent uh, group of people. That's how they got enslaved in the first place, and you see that going on in society as it is right now, where people become complacent, and they don't fight, and they don't um, lift themselves up and try to make changes and they just go ahead with everything that's happened and this enslavement gets worse and worse and was worse as a result so what God wanted to do was bring them to the land of promise but first he had to change them he had to change their past habits from uh, being raised in Egypt and the surrounding area where there was a lot of wickedness going on and this is all a segue into giving them his commandments, and he had to prepare them for all of this. So one of the things he wanted with the laws was for them to love one another. If you had an inability to love God, how are you going to be able to love your brothers and sisters or those around you in your community? So it was important for God for them to learn to love him and trust him. What the Ten Commandments in uh, the next couple of verses is going to do, it's going to bring them into a place of holiness. Remember, they were spiritually dead and they were you know, far from God. So now we have fellowship and we're united with God, at least they were. This was a way for God to show them how he wanted them to live. He wanted them to be a holy people. And eventually his church was going to come through there. That meant that these people had to be responsible and they had to have mannerisms that were responsible and to follow the law. Let's go for a moment to Deuteronomy 11, 1, 4. There's something there that I want to read to you. In, in Deuteronomy 11, 4, it says, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. Know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm, and his miracles and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and unto all his land. Number four, and what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord had destroyed them unto this day. Sorry, that's Muffin um, snoring under there. But as you can see, that all the way up in Deuteronomy, they talk about how the Egyptians never recovered after what uh, they were put through with God. Remember, they were one of the most powerful countries in the whole world at that time, but they never recovered, and Pharaoh never recovered either. So let's get into it today. Let's go to chapter 20, verse number 1 in Exodus. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God spoke these words audibly. Remember last week in Mount Sinai, he spoke them audibly to the Israelites. And he wanted them to know that he came directly to them, not going through Moses, but to hear the actual words of God telling them because anybody could Moses could have been some guy people could start to say oh well we don't know if it's true that God is talking to you but evidently 
because people forget about signs and wonders and all the things he's been showing. But God wanted to make sure that the people heard his voice and knew that he was with them and that everything that he's saying was not made up. It wasn't coming from something out of Moses's brain. It was actually coming from God. These laws were going to be things that God needed the people to do. Verse number three, thou shalt have no other gods before me. We're getting into the commandments and this at this point, and we're going to be talking about these and I'm going to be breaking them down. That's why I didn't want to, uh, last week I didn't want to rush through it because I want to make sure that we get all of this information. So reading from my notes, I wrote that the 10 commandments are organized into two groups. The first four of the commandments focus on our conduct toward God and the next six focus on our conduct toward one another. God had three purposes for this law. He wanted it to be kind of like a guardrail to keep humanity in a moral path, to show us what it's like for someone to have a true heart for God and to want to live holy just like Jesus Christ did. This part here is just letting them know because they remember they came from Egypt so there were many gods that they worshiped in Egypt and but in this verse where he's saying thou shalt have no other gods before me means there's only one true God you need to believe solely in that one true God and nothing else nobody else except for one true God this is the most important commandment of all it is the basis it is the root of everything that comes from there if you can't totally trust God and believe in the truth of God then basically it's a domino effect. You won't have success in anything in your life because the root of everything comes from believing and trusting in God. Verse number four, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that it is in the water underneath the earth. You know, I read this, I read this commandment and I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by the amount of churches that have idols and graven images inside their churches where uh, evidently the bible talks about those things and they still do it and they put them outside and and a lot of times i wonder what are these churches doing do they not even read this stuff anyway let's go on to number five thou shalt now bow down thyself to them nor serve them for i the lord thy god am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me if you have a lot of bad situations in your life and you believe that you are under generational curse this commandment is will solidify that for you because if you have generational curses and you're walking with the lord you need to break those curses in your life and right here it tells you about those curses so from my notes, I wrote that the Israelites were from Egypt and they couldn't understand how to worship one God because for them, they had a God for each of the blessings. So they didn't understand how one God can give them blessing for like, you know, for their for their cattle and for the weather and for fertility and those kinds of things. They just they had to learn. This is all a, a brand new learning thing they had to do. Um, so remember that no matter if you follow the nine commandments, but the main one, the first one that we talked about is one of the most important. That's not going to get you to the top because the most important one is the one that we just read, which is in the top. You need to follow only God. It also represents not just God. You can, you can, you can believe and trust in God, but if you are, on, if your, if your scales are off where you are more fixated on your work and your job than you are of God when you put that above this then you have also made that your idol so you have to try to balance everything out in your life where you also give time to God spend time with him doing holy things um you know maybe celebrate maybe uh, doing the sabbath celebrating the sabbath bringing your kids up in the word those types of things you have to make it a point to follow him when you hear about god's jealousy in the bible it's not an evil jealousy it's one where he refuses to share the human heart with 
arrival. He knows that the moral life that you lead is going to be strictly dependent on him. If you are believing in, you know, fertility goddess or some other thing, then you are going to sway in your morality and you're and you and you're not going to walk holy and you won't be able to have fellowship with God if you're not doing those things. That's why it's important to only have one God, our God, the one and only God. But one of the things that I want to talk about this with the children is if the parents don't love God and it, get, it gets passed down to the children, the children were also going to be cursed. But the children can rectify that by going to Christ, accepting Christ, and breaking that curse off of them from their family. You were raised in a family of atheists, and now you are believing in God. You are actually breaking those curses in your family, and you need to break them in the name of Jesus, of Yeshua. Make sure you say the word Yeshua whenever you say Jesus, because you want to make sure that you're praying to the one and only Yeshua, Jesus Christ and uh, break those curses in your life you have the authority to do so let's go to verse number six and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments verse seven thou shalt not take the name of the lord thy god in vain for the lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain in this verse i'm reading from my notes it shows here that god is talking about profanity which is using the name of God in blasphemy by cursing and mentioning his name with a lot of frivolity, using the name of God in a superficial and stupid way, and then also claiming God, but then acting in a way that's hypocritical and disgraces him. Don't beat yourself if you still say, oh my God, you know, I try to say, oh my gosh, once in a while it'll slip, but Catch yourself when you do it, and when your children do it as well, you need to also um, talk to them, you know, reprimand them, but also talk to them and explain to them why it's important for them not to say that. Okay, verse number eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is a really important one because I know God's been giving this one to me a lot because I work a lot. I work practically seven days out of the week, and I realize that I get burned out and I really have to take some quiet time to myself and I'm definitely going to start making it a point to follow the Sabbath. But the reason I read from my notes that uh, God wanted the Sabbath was he wanted humanity to make sure that they separated a sacred time in their life to rest and to think about God and to be grateful for that day of rest because it's a day that God demands so who doesn't like a day off? I mean, aren't you grateful when you get a day off like Memorial Day or Independence Day, those kind of things, and you're able to be with your family and go camping or go to the beach? Well, you should always be grateful for the Sabbath, that one weekend that God is actually saying in his natural laws. Because I bet you the way that they're trying to enslave us nowadays, if it wasn't for a law like this, we'd still be working. I mean, a lot of us still do because this is that balance that I'm talking about. Or some of you have to work on those days because you don't get a day off. But I know God knows your heart. But remember, even if you have to work on the Sabbath because you work for a grocery store or you're a taxi driver and you have to work on those days, you should be dedicating another day of the week for rest and time with God and just talk to God about that God is very understanding verse number nine six days shall thee labor and do all thy work but the t but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God in it thou shalt not do any work thou nor thy son nor thy daughter thy main servant nor thy maid servant nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates verse number 11 for six days the Lord had made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. From my notes, I'm reading that the Sabbath was set aside for rest and worship to refresh one's spirit so that God can bless the people. Here, God is also reestablishing the pattern for the Sabbath from the time of creation when he also rested. Verse number 12. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God 
giveth thee. So for my notes, I wrote that God wanted to build strong families as a foundation, which is an essential building block for stability and health of society and we couldn't have the younger generation at war with the older generation he wanted the younger generation to respect and give authority to the older generation he wanted them to be courteous and polite and peaceful within families and it just ends up, and we're not just talking about children little children we're talking about you could be 30 years old, you could be 50 years old, you still have to be respectful and courteous to your parents and honor them during their aging process. And God is also showing in this commandment that there is a price to pay when you disobey his commandments because he's telling them right there, right there, you will live long upon the land. So that means that he might put a disease on you. He might cause some type of a curse on you if you are disobeying your parents. And why is it important for this it, within the family for the generations to get along? Because we, there, what you're seeing right now in society, when people are talking about depopulation, at some point down the line, when you start crossing this path of population control, you are going to start to see where they may feel that older people, 80 and 90 years old, are not worthy to be here. And that's where you're going to see euthanasia. So that's why respect for your elders is important because the young, younger ones could feel, well, you know, they're just a burden on us. So let's just get rid of them after they're, you know, when they get to 80, we'll just get rid of them. This is why that's evil. These are evil things. And God wants to make sure that those things don't get into the hearts of his people. Verse number 13, thou shall not kill. And we just talked about that. With that idea of having something like that, we segue into this where it says thou shall not kill. So you don't have the right in euthanasia also either. I'm telling you from this verse. I also want to talk about how in Matthew 5, in the New Testament, Matthew 5, uh, verses 21 to 26, Jesus showed us that hating someone is also a form of killing them because you could also be wishing them dead in your heart. And this hatred is just as bad as actually doing the physical killing. So you have to be very careful with killing somebody it within your heart as well. Thou shall not commit adultery. Number 15, thou shall not steal. Number 16, thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I think we don't have to talk about adultery and we don't have to talk about uh, stealing because we all know what that is. But let's talk about this one, about the false witness. It makes reference to lying in court and also it um, it's needed because of incorruptible justice systems. Um, in Exodus 20, 16, all of this I'm reading from my notes. When we go to this verse, it gives us more definition about testifying falsely, which includes lying in court, leaving parts out of a story, telling half-truths, twisting the facts, and inventing falsehood, which are all forms of deception. So this is another point that I read in my study for this particular verse that I think is really important that we have to mention here. So I'm going to read it from my notes. It says that this is also going to mention about the inappropriate silence that breaks this command because when someone says something falsely about another person and you hear it and know that the statement is untrue, but because you have reasons of fear or being disliked or unpopular and you remain quiet and don't speak up you are guilty and you are breaking the law just as if you were the one that told the law because silence is what makes it seem that it's true you have to rebuke lies 
It's our job as Christians to rebuke lies and put the facts out. You have to be the change on this earth and you have to stand up and you, and the way you can do that is trusting that God wants you to do that. Believing in God. A lot of you are you, you're Christians, but you're fearful. You're fearful of everything. You're fearful of speaking up. And society and the media knows it. This is why we're having the problems that we have now. Verse number 17. Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. My notes, I wrote that this is about resenting what others have that you don't have and you want it, you are envious of it. And this, is, this, this could be some form of bitterness or indignation, which could, be an, we could develop into an anger and an annoyance provoked thinking that there's an unfair treatment that why don't you have this um because basically what it comes down to is that you are dissatisfied with what you have and you're looking for something better but realize a lot of times it has to do with you what's in your heart why why are you dissatisfied inside you don't ever have to be envious of anybody because God provides for all of us. There's always enough provision in this world for everybody. Verse number 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. So it's God's choice here on how he wants to speak to you in this particular way. He is showing them the lightning and the thunder and the noise of the trumpet, he might come to you in a different way. Verse number 19, And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. The people didn't were afraid to listen to God. Uh, they felt that they needed a mediator, and they asked for one. And this is where we get into the future where Jesus Christ is going to be the mediator for one because the Israelites are asking for a mediator here. And this is exactly what God wants. God wanted them to ask for a mediator because he knew the plans that were coming in the future with the Messiah, with Yeshua, who he was going to provide to be the mediator between us and God in fellowship. Verse number 20, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your face, that ye sin not. Let's go to verse 21, And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. 22, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. 23 ye shall not make with me gods of silver neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold it's very clear that god is saying that he doesn't want them to make an image of him verse 24 an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings thy sheep and thine oxen in all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. So for my notes, I wrote that these specific instructions were giving for the building of the altars eventually. And it would teach how to worship him and how they were to control the sacrifices and offerings and to the how they were going to prevent idolatry not having shapes of things was going to prevent idolatry you know not maybe graven images or anything like that because god didn't want them to make these images and put it anywhere he didn't want them to start creating their own religion it had to be in one particular place and the laws had to be watched by the men that were appointed to make sure that these were the things that were coming from God, not from some person in their tent who had an image of a God. And then they were saying that, you know, we have this religion because God is against creating our own religion. Let's go to verse 25. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, 
For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. So the reason that he didn't want them to carve anything is because that they could have taken the stone eventually and they could have glorified it. And God didn't want to share his glory with some rock. You, you didn't later on, you know, come back and start it over time. They could start, you know, believing that this rock was God and praying to the rock. You don't pray to the rock. You pray here to God, but you don't pray to the rock. So this is why um, they weren't supposed to do that. Verse 26. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. So God, from my notes I wrote that God, he wanted to make sure there was no display of human flesh as you were walking up to the altar and to make sure that the leg of the priest wasn't seen um, during his worship. So they had to be covered up. The skin had to be covered up. All right, let's go now to chapter 21 in Exodus, verse number one. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. So judgments were considered laws. So laws were given because of the effects of our consequences. And so we had to act responsibly uh, to avoid some of the bad consequences from some of these laws. So verse number two, if thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve. And in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. So let's talk about this slavery because some people talk about that the Bible promotes slavery. But the thing is that most people don't understand the Bible, we'll talk about it in a second, didn't and he did they didn't encourage it. It already existed. It existed from years way before Exodus it was something that was happened all the time. We saw that in Joseph where he was sold as a slave. Um so the, what the what Bible doesn't encourage it. The Bible wants you to be humane with the slaves. The Bible is responsible for the elimination of slavery. Because as you hear, see here, if you were a slave, you were supposed to go free after seven years. Let's talk first about why some people, some Hebrews would actually still have slaves. So some slaves, some people actually volunteered to be slaves because they were poor. So they had to work. So they were willing to be with a family and serve them in order to be, to have provisions and provided for. But they could work towards their freedom and they were also treated humanely. The Bible makes sure about that. And remember way right back here in, ver in chapter 20, uh, let's go back there for a second. The very first chapter verses 1 and 2 in chapter 20 it says and God spake all these words saying I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage I brought you out of slavery so right here God is saying I want to free you I want to bring you out of slavery I don't want slavery I want you to be free from this ultimately by reading that before he gives us his commandments is what he's telling us that he does not want us to be in bondage and in slavery. I just want to make sure that we understand because I think I skipped this part. How do some people become slaves? Well, they became slaves because they were poor. Some of them because of a death. Maybe a, a wife's husband died and now she didn't have provision because she didn't have children. So she couldn't go to work for somebody, and, you know, cooking, cleaning. Also, if you committed a crime, you were also sometimes commanded to serve the family where you as a retro a restitution for what you did so we'll talk about that coming up but just that's just some reasons for slavery verse number three if he came by himself he shall go out by himself if he were married then his wife shall go out with him so let's talk about this for a second at the end of six years the the slave was able to go out now if you were married if you were if, if, if the husband was a slave coming into a family to become their slave and you were already married when you on the six years when you were able to leave your wife can go with you but if you married another slave that was serving you could go but that slave person had to fulfill their time 
So let's say she's on her third year and you're on your sixth. You could go, but this person had to stay behind until they finished their time as slaves. Okay, another form of slavery. Let me just mention here because I wrote this here and over here. It says not just po poverty, but some people actually did want to, they didn't want to be alone. So they wanted to be with a family and they were willing to serve. Um, so they didn't have to worry about providing for themselves, let's say. They knew their the provision was going to come from whatever family that there was. Um, also, a father might sell his daughter as a servant into a home with the intention that she is going to eventually be married into the family. And also, in the case of a bankruptcy, a man might become a servant to his creditor. That's another way. And another way is if a thief had nothing to pay for proper restitution when he got caught, he would serve the people that he stole from. So those are different ways. The type of slavery in the Bible was normally chosen or it was mutually arranged, but it was for a limited duration and it was also highly regulated. So it wasn't just that anybody could do anything that they wanted. There was a level of humanity to this concept that was all over the world, but the Israelites were humane in their approach to it. Verse number four, if his master have given him a wife and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself. Verse number five, and if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. If after the six years, a servant wanted to continue to make a lifelong commitment to his master because the master was good to him and blessed him, there was a ceremony that, would make, that they would make to make this lifelong commitment that they were going to stay. And it wasn't a debt obligation but it was only through their love for their master and the good things that the master provided. And that's the reason that they would have the ceremony to stay with them forever. Verse number six, then his master shall bring him unto the judge. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl and he shall serve him forever. So let's talk about this because this describes, from my notes I wrote, this describes a public recognition ceremony for recognizing a willing slave who wanted to fulfill his obligation to his service master. Because he loved him, they would do the ceremony where it included the doorpost at the master's house. It would pierce the ear of the person with an awl and it had to be, all of this had to be in the presence of witnesses that you couldn't say later on that you were forced or whatever. This was nothing forced. This was you saying, yes, I want to continue to do this. God's law said after six years, and if you stayed on, it could have been presumed that you were holding this person back and you were against the law. So it had to come from that person that they were willing to stay. And that's why you had to have judges and you have to have witnesses for this ceremony to kind of cleanse you or keep you from somebody coming back and presuming that you were holding them as, um, you were kidnapping them as slaves after the six years. Remember that back in the days of Egypt, the pagans had a custom of branding the slaves with their name or some type of a signal that the owner had. And this was contrary to what God shows us because God likes it when you love your master or you get along with them and they treat you well and you want to stay there or you're willing to go the other ones you know they would treat them bad these pagans and they would they wouldn't have a way of getting out of the situation so you can see there's a difference here of how you know god was working through all of this at that time when there were slaves he was given the opportunity to get out of slavehood or stay and serve the person you were with, kind of like a family. Verse number seven, and if a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. 
Verse number eight, if she please not her master who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he shall have no power, seeing he hath de dealt deceitfully with her. This means if she was sold for marriage, but he didn't marry this woman or he decided to give her to his son, he was still obligated to respect her. I'm reading from my notes, her to respect her rights under God. He had to treat her well and he had to give her the opportunity, opportunity to escape the obligation of being servant because if not, it was considered a breach of contract and he, can't, he couldn't sell her to another master because that would also be a breach of contract. It would be a breach of the marriage obligation and she would be deprived of the comforts of the home. She had to be treated according to the customs, just like if she was his daughter. So as you can see, there was a lot of things that were going on at the time that God wanted to make sure that people were, were treated well. Verse number nine, and if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. Number 10, and he take him another wife. Her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall not shall he not diminish. Verse number 11. And if he do not these three unto her, then shall she go out free without money. So she would be granted freedom is what we were doing. We all of these verses we just talked about. Verse number 12. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. This is going to refer back to Genesis in uh, 9, verse number 6, where you were not allowed to shed the blood of man. Verse number 13, and God spoke very early on about killing, which is what happened with Cain and Abel. Verse number 13, and if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whether he shall flee. So from my notes, I wrote that God commanded that Israel makes cities of refuge. And these were prepared cities where one could flee in the case of manslaughter until your case was properly heard. Now, this was mostly going to happen when there was some type of an accidental death or where you had people who thought that you did it and accused you. You had before you went in front of the judge, you had a place to go to because remember the family might want to have revenge on you and they might want to kill you before your day of court came. You had to prove that you were innocent. It had to do with malice. Did you want to kill somebody? Did you have malice in your heart? Did you plan it? Was it predetermined that you wanted to kill this person? Some people, we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes, but um what what the different situations are here let's go to verse number 14 but if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die so i'm reading from my notes it says that god wanted the judges to look for evidence of premeditation and of betrayal God did not place accidents or crimes of passion or neglect on the same level as crimes of premeditation and betrayal. Another thing is punishing the murderers was important to God. He denied the murderers the refuge of his altar. And if we go to, if we, we're not going to read it today. You could do this on your own. But if you read Numbers 35, chapter 35, verse 31, and 33 through 34 it's going to talk a lot more about all of this there verse number 15 and he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death this is to note that children who murder or attempt to murder their parent would need to receive capital punishment and it doesn't have to be a child of five-year-olds this could be a 50 year old who doesn't want to deal with taking care of his parent and decides to kill them um, and it's premeditated murder. They will receive capital punishment as a result. Verse number 16. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. This has to deal with now with kidnapping of a person. Now this was considered a capital offense. I'm reading from my notes because it meant that they were enslaving the person. Criminally 
and here it is clearly prohibited and this is very different type of slavery than the slavery that we talked about earlier and we see here that they're going into now human trafficking of people um which is later on what happens in the world and what's still happening today unfortunately verse number 17 and he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death for my notes i wrote that the idea here represents that an adult child threatened a parent and this was severe because the intention of god was to preserve the foundation of a civilized society to respect the generations before and after it also gave protection to the child because the parent couldn't carry out the punishment but the case had to go to the elders and the judges of the city first if you had a parent who was threatening and saying all of these things that the child wanted to do that it would go to court so it would protect the child as well verse number 18 and if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist and he die not but keepeth his bed verse number 19 if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff then shall he that smote him be quit only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed in this verse in this verse here shows that compensation was required if you injured someone in other cultures the master was always held blameless but under god's laws a servant was also a human person it would reveal what the intent of the person was because of discipline and not an intentional attack and so the the main theme of this law was to restrict the the power of the master over the slave to make sure that they knew that there were repercussions also when they tried to discipline a slave they had to be cautious of that because things could get out of hand and it showed them that the slave was a person and they just couldn't be murdered so you couldn't just beat them to death or anything like that verse number 21 notwithstanding if he continue a day or two he shall not be punished for he is his money verse 22 if men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruits apart from her and yet no mischief follow he shall be surely punished according as a woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judge determines all right so from my notes i wrote that this shows that if a pregnant woman was injured in a conflict and she gave premature birth there would be a retribution assessed if she had lasting damage um and there would be an award and this shows that only permanent consequences should be compensated but if this was actually an accidental assault the offender had to pay some type of retribution or restitution compensation to the mother verse number 23 and if any mischief follow then thou shalt give life for life so you need to understand this verse also with numbers this is from my notes with numbers 35 verse 31 this chapter 35 31 where you were allowed to substitute with some type of payment for the loss of life when it was not a premeditated murder so they were getting some kind of restitution you are allowed to do that verse number 24 eye for an eye tooth for a tooth hand for hand foot for foot all right let's talk about this one an eye for an eye this i'm reading from my notes was a guide for judges not to justify revenge it was created that the fun the punishment had to fit the crime so that's what this whole thing is about here so it prevented a cruel and barbaric punishments from ancient countries that were too harsh and unfair and one too lenient is off so was too powerful to to teach lessons so you had to kind of level off the punishment with whatever the crime is that's what that verse 24 is about this law was for the judges okay for the judges to make determinations this law meant to block a man's desire for vengeance and he was not given a license for wage this also stopped you from doing something so now you were careful to make sure and hold yourself back from doing some of these things this kind of type of vengeance on people 
Verse 25, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. 26, and if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. So basically, if you hit a servant and they lost an eye, now you are supposed to free the slave. 27, and if he smite out his maid servants, his man servant's tooth or his maid servant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. So this is showing basically that the master had to protect and honor the slave and treat them like an employee and not like some type of a farm animal or something like that. Verse 28, if an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall be surely stoned and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. The word quit here means that it's acquitted. So he's not going to be guilty. The bull or the ox got loose and trampled on somebody and killed them. You were supposed to kill the animal, but you don't eat it, of course. You're not gonna cook and make a barbecue. But the, the, the owner, you know, it was an accidental death. And the animal got away, so the owner's not responsible in that way. They're, he's losing money because he just lost his ox and some people you know make money on that so you have to be careful with your animals back then verse 29 but if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past and it has been testified to his owner and he had not kept him in but that he had killed a man or a woman the ox shall be stoned and his owner also shall be put to death well let's talk about this because now it's the opposite now it's that this ox is a hazard he's dangerous he's proven to be dangerous he's been told several witnesses have told this person that this animal is bad and the in its aggressive animal and the owner fails to control the animal this is a different situation because you were held responsible and you could die but from my notes i also wrote that it was also acceptable to pay the survivors a monetary restitution for the death of their family member as a settlement. So you could have gotten away from the death, but you had a hefty lump to pay for that to the family that lost a loved one. Verse number 30, if there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him. Verse 31, whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to his judgment, shall it be done unto him. So from my notes, I wrote that this is going to show you the same principles were applied to the death of minors because they were also regarded as people with rights to respect as well as adults. So it wasn't just adults, you also children, uh, if you murdered a child, you were also going to be treated with the same way. You were going to be a life for life. It didn't have to be adults only. Children were respected. Their lives were respected as well. Verse 32. If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. So this was basically the 30 shekels of stone was the price of restitution, which was considered the price also of a slave. That's what they cost back then. And if a man shall open a pit or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it and an ox or an ass fall therein, 34, the owner of the pit shall make it good and give money unto the owner of them and the dead beast shall be his. These pits in the ground, they were for storage, but they were most likely for storing water. Um, and they were also traps for animals. But back in Genesis, if you remember when we read uh, back in Joseph's time, that they were also used as prisons for men, these uh, pits that were in the ground. Verse 34, the owner of the pit shall make it good and give money unto the owner of them and the death, dead beast shall be his. And if one man's ox hurt another's that he die, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it. And the dead ox also they shall divide. Or if it be known that the ox hath used to push in time past and his owner has not kept him in, he shall surely pay ox for ox and the dead shall be his own. So I'm reading from my notes now it says, in the law, it was necessary for judges to investigate and analyze the findings of the intent or negligence because 
to a struggling farmer, a fair payment for the death of his ox might mean the difference between life and death to his family. And it could also mean freedom or slavery for a debt. So it was very important for them to go before the judge and figure this out. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for this week. I thank you so much for watching. I hope that this was helpful and beneficial to you. This is just um, my way of teaching is basically so that I can open up the word for you a little bit, explain a little bit more in relation to some historical things that were happening back then. It kind of opens your world up a little bit more to understand the word of God, to what was happening back then, to understanding the people, the people that God chose. And through all of this is to represent God's character, what he wanted, and ultimately also to show you that the, that the Old Testament and the New Testament correlate, that the New Testament wasn't something that just happened. This was God's plan coming into existence over time through these stories that we see here. We see how he has been moving us toward the civilization that we have now and that we have the redemption of Jesus Christ available to us. I hope that that is something that you will reflect on today and really look in your heart. And if you're not sure, just ask him into your heart to reveal his presence and his wisdom and to show you the way to guide your way and the rest will just happen naturally. So I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that it's something that you're going to reflect on this week and you will come to him and you can follow these Bible studies every week. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel so you can start understanding the Bible and all of the things that are in there. It's such an exciting time to read right now when there's so much media and social media and everything is our phones. It's nice to be able to get into an actual book and highlight and be with God in the word. And it's just so different from everything that, that we're going on around us with technology. So I thank you so much for watching this week. Stay tuned for my Armor of God video coming up uh, in midweek. And then my Bible study again will be in chapter 22 and 23 next week. Have a wonderful week. God bless. And if you need prayer requests, please leave it down below. Bye-bye. Thank you.